Hello and welcome back to the channel. In this week's episode, I'm going to be doing our first mailbag episode. So last week I included a survey in the description section of my video titled mailbag questions. It's a really simple two question survey. You enter your question and then you enter your first name. And this is a collection of questions that I have accumulated over the past few months. And the format of this episode is going to be, there's five questions that I picked out of the pile of questions that I sort of had kept in a note. And I'm going to talk about the answers to each of those questions. This is going to be a little bit less scripted. I'm going to be speaking from point form notes, but the goal here is to really answer as many questions as I can. So I hope you find it interesting. If you like this style of video and you want to have your question answered, just simply go to the description section below, click on the survey, enter your question, and then I'll include uh, your uh, answer in an upcoming uh, episode of uh, the mailbag video. And if we haven't met yet, my name is Mark Walhout, and I created this channel to share ideas and concepts that I'm using to help people with retirement. If you want to get more videos like these, consider subscribing to the channel and hit the bell icon so you're alerted when new videos are posted. So we'll start with our first question, which is CPP versus old age security deferral. Which one should I defer until later? And whenever I get an either this or that question, uh, generally the advice is let's throw this into a financial planning software application to be certain because everybody's situation is different. But that aside, just based on the question as it's posed, if I'm asked which one I prefer that people hold off to take until later, usually it's Canada Pension Plan. And there's really three main reasons behind that. The first is that the deferral benefit after age 65 is greater with Canada Pension Plan than it is for old age security. So the increase to your benefit uh, if you defer past age 65 is 0.7% per month for every month that you wait past 65 or 8.4% per year a 42% total benefit enhancement from delaying taking Canada Pension Plan from age 65 and waiting all the way to age 70. Whereas with old age security, that deferral benefit is 0.6% per month, 7.2% per year, and a 36% total benefit from delaying from 65 to 70. So not a huge difference there, but a difference nonetheless. There is a little bit more benefit for delaying your Canada Pension Plan than for old age security. The second reason is that old age security does not have an estate benefit. When the old age security pensioner dies, the surviving spouse gets no benefit. As opposed to Canada Pension Plan, there is the potential that the survivor will receive a survivor pension when the uh, first member of the spouse couple passes away. And then finally, delaying taking benefits is difficult for people. And in my years working with retirees, our natural inclination, especially if we get a letter in the mail or if we're speaking to a neighbor or a friend or family member that says, hey, I started taking my Canada pension plan, I'm, eight, I'm 60 years old, or I took old age security as soon as I turned age 65, knowing that you could potentially have another source of income coming in and delaying it kind of goes against our nature. So generally, I would say, you know, if you sort of are confronted with this decision for a retiree, I'd say, okay, take the old age security at age 65, the deferral benefit's not as great. So at least then you're kind of scratching the itch of taking some guaranteed retirement income that you perceive that's coming from the government so that it gives you the you know shot of willpower that it takes to continue to defer the Canada Pension Plan benefit. The second question is, I want to learn more about income investment strategies, specifically how much time it would take to build a minimum 10% return per year portfolio that supports a $5,000 per month expense lifestyle for early retirement. So the objective here is income investing, targeting a 10% return. And the person asking the question has outlined what they want in terms of a monthly income. So we'll start with sort of my preferences when it comes to building retirement income portfolios. So generally, I prefer total return investing where we're aiming to generate long term investment growth from dividends and capital gains from stocks. We're going to talk about capital gains in a little bit, as well as interest and capital gains from bonds. And income investing, as I hear people describe it to me, or I believe that a lot of people want to perceive it or do perceive it, it aims to preserve the underlying asset and not touch it. So hold on to sort of that principal amount and simply farm the portfolio. I'm going to say kind of farm in air quotes to sort of take what the portfolio spins off every year in yield from things like dividend stocks or high yield bonds and increasingly GICs. And there are three issues with this approach. Number one, this approach often pushes people to under diversify their investments. So they might build a portfolio of 10 to 15 dividend paying stocks 
Whereas in the global universe of stocks, there are well over 10,000, 20,000 individual publicly traded stocks that are out there in the universe. So the idea of limiting our investment exposure to only 10 or 12, let's call them dividend paying stocks, to me is far too under diversified for a long term investment portfolio in retirement. The second issue I have with this approach is that it often pushes people towards riskier investments. So the person asking the question is asking for a minimum 10% return per year, but let's say they want to aim at a 10% yield. You can find stocks that are yielding over 10%, but that might be the result of that stock price recently going down dramatically, and that stock has gone down dramatically for a reason. If the stock's now yielding 10%, whereas before it was previously yielding 5%, you know the reason that it's now you know, very quickly thereafter yielding 10 is that the underlying business or the price of the underlying stock has gone down. And so there's a, probably a reason for that. And if the yield is incredibly high relative to the underlying value of the equity, you might be looking at other issues. It's possible that that dividend might be on the chopping block and that dividend income might be cut off or it might be slashed. I also see people sort of moving in this field towards things like high yield bonds, real estate investment trusts, I once got a question about um, some sovereign debt that was currently yielding, you know, 10 to 14 percent per year. And I can't remember the name of the country or which country it was, sorry, but it was somewhere in sort of Central America. And the, the questioner was like, hey, should I buy these bonds? They're currently yielding, yeah, I think it was like 12 percent or 14 percent. This is a few years ago. And I said, you know, I, I don't want to give you advice on this topic because we hadn't done a plan, but you know there's a reason why that sovereign bond is yielding 10, 12% when Canadian domestic bonds, government bonds are yielding at the time closer to two to 3%. There's something risky about that underlying asset that is uh, creating a situation where it's yielding higher than sort of equivalent bonds from you know Canada or the United States, for example. So the second reason is it is pushing people towards riskier investments. The third reason that I don't love this approach to investing is it ignores a major source of returns, which is capital gains. So capital gains occur when the underlying asset increases in value over the price that you purchased it at, resulting in a gain. That's profit that you can pay yourself or that you can realize if you sell that underlying asset. And there are many, many stocks in the global equity universe that don't pay dividends and would otherwise not be included in a portfolio that's just targeting yield. And we don't have to look very far in the United States over the past decade or so. A lot of the highest growing equities are growth stocks that don't pay any dividends. So if you were building a portfolio strictly to create dividend income, you would be missing out on a lot of growth in a portfolio by making that your sort of core strategy. The second part of the question had to do with the expectations. So the questioner asked about building a portfolio that would deliver a minimum 10% annual total return. And in my opinion, aiming at that re total return might be a tad optimistic for a long-term retirement portfolio. And if we look back over history, as long as we have good data, global stocks over long periods of time on average, and I'm going to emphasize on average, have returned somewhere between 9 and 10% per year. But that's an average. That's over the entire time sample, which is many, many decades uh, but in that intervening period, there have been many deep and long drawdowns that would be catastrophic for a retiree if they're withdrawing regularly from a portfolio that was going through an extended downturn. So what types of expectations are reasonable? The financial planning software that I use is called Conquest. And the return expectations that are currently built into the back end of that system that I use for client plans for a portfolio of 60% stocks and 40% bonds, we're currently estimating a pre-fee return expectation of 5.22% per year on average for an extended period like a 30-year retirement. Now, returns over the next 20 to 30 years could be higher. They could potentially be lower. But in terms of the average expectation, 5.22% to me is a bit more prudent uh, for you know, a properly diversified portfolio of equities and fixed income. And we want to not program into our plan the expectation that we're going to get significantly higher returns because if we don't get those returns, that plan is going to be in peril as it reaches sort of its second half and later phases in life. And for those that don't have access to financial planning software, FP Canada releases projection assumption guidelines that include some reasonable assumptions for what stocks and bonds are going to return going forward. And you can use that if you're doing your own long-term financial projections. The third question is about inflation. And the question reads, inflation factor, how is it added to your calculator? And this was actually a 
question that came in from somebody following a video that I showed where I walked through a scenario with my financial planning software. And the person wanted to know what is the inflation expectation that's built into that software. So currently the inflation, the long-term inflation expectation that's built into the back end of Conquest is 2.2% per year. Now you might be looking at that number and think 2.2% seems very low relative to the current inflation that we're experiencing and you'd be absolutely correct. But it was not long ago that before COVID when we had 2.1% built into the system for financial plans that people would look at 2.1% and be like, wow, we haven't seen two plus percent inflation in many years. Is, you know, Are we really gonna get that kind of inflation? And really what we're aiming at here is sort of a long-term inflation average through time. And again, for retirees, most reti retirement plans that I'm building out uh, are built for 20 to 30 year time periods. The 2.2% inflation number is really trying to mirror the Bank of Canada's uh, target inflation number. So that I think that's where the 2.2% comes from. In the FP Canada projection guidelines that I mentioned just a couple minutes ago, they set their long-term inflation expectation at 2.1% per year. So that's kind of the answer to the question about how inflation is included in my calculations. But planning for inflation is very, very critical. It's a very good question. Canadians are, you know, this is good news. Like we're healthier, we're living longer. And so inflation is going to weigh in big time on how financial plans kind of bear out over the next 20, 30 years. Things are going to continue to cost more as inflation continues to rise through time. And we need to keep this in mind because we need to have income streams and we need to be able to plan for making sure that there's enough money coming in every month to be able to keep up with inflation through time. Question number four, the questioner asks, I'm teaching my kids the best account between RSP or TFSA in the long run. Which one is better? And this is a great question. One of the great things about my job is that I get to meet with a lot of clients and oftentimes they say, you know what, we're really enjoying working with you, Mark. Can you speak with our child that's kind of just finishing university, getting started in the working world about sort of how to set them up with you know, regular saving and getting ready for their future? And so this is a natural question. I do get it often. Uh, it was written in, but it's it's one that I sort of brush up against all the time. Which account is better? A different account types like RSPs, tax-free savings accounts, RESPs, first home savers accounts. These are really just tools in a toolkit. There's no better one or worse one. There's really just trying to figure out the best one for your unique situation. And the analogy that, that I like to draw when I explain this to people is picture, you know, Christmas morning, if you celebrate, celebrate Christmas, uh, you can have different colored boxes under the tree. You could have a green box, you could have a blue box, you could have a red box, but all those boxes could can contain socks. So all those boxes can look different, but they can all contain the same thing. And in the same way, RSPs and tax-free savings accounts, they're simply different color containers. They have different tax properties from each other, but inside of those containers, you can put exchange traded funds, you can put GICs, you can put mutual funds, you can put individual stocks. So I'd like to you know, encourage you to think about these different account types more as just tax containers that have different unique tax properties. And the goal of setting up one account versus the other really just comes down to a question, what is the need for the particular person saving? So we'll bring forward a couple of examples that might help you sort of think of this. So picture a young person whose primary goal is to save for retirement. Well, in that case, the RSP generally makes a lot of sense. If the, the person saving either currently has or expects in the near future to have a higher income now than they expect to have in retirement, then they will generally realize a net benefit from putting their money into an RSP, getting the tax deduction today while they're in a higher income tax bracket, having that money grow tax sheltered in the account, and then make a withdrawal from the account down the road in retirement when they expect to be in a lower tax bracket. That's generally how RSPs work the best. So if a young person came to me with that, fact pattern, I would say, let's talk about or think about the RSP. If that same young person said, you know what, Mark, I'm not so much thinking about retirement, but I'm really excited about buying a first home. Well, you may still want to look at the RSP because the RSP offers the home buyer's plan, which allows you to take money out of your RSP without immediate tax consequences, provided that you're buying a qualifying first home. And there's a new account called the first home savers account, which sort of combines some of the best things of RSPs and tax-free savings accounts. When you make contributions, you can deduct those contributions from your income in the current year, or you can sort of hold on to that deduction and use it in a future year. The money grows tax shelter within the account and provided that the withdrawal that you eventually make is to purchase a qualifying first home, that withdrawal from the FHSA can be tax free. So different situation, different answer to the question. Number one, that person wanted to primarily save for retirement. I think RSP is probably a good path for them. 
Number two is a house, so it's gonna be either RSP or FHSA or ideally both because you can use the FHSA alongside the RSP home buyer's plan. Now let's think of a third scenario. There's a young person that wants to save to buy their first car in 10 years. Well, in that case, I would say the tax-free savings account probably makes the most sense. Contributions are made with after-tax dollars. They grow tax-free. Withdrawals from the tax-free savings account are also made tax-free and any amounts withdrawn can be regenerated in the following year. That person would not want to make an RSP contribution with that money that they wanted to use for the car because if they make the RSP contribution, they get a tax deduction. The money, when it eventually comes out, is going to be taxable in their hands. And if they're earning an income in their job, they might create an adverse scenario where they're going to have a net tax cost to doing that if they take the money out of the RSP to buy the car. So three different scenarios, three different fact patterns, three different account possibilities. So like everything with planning, it's better to sort of evaluate your use case based on you know, the facts for your particular situation and then speak with a planner and figure out the right mix of accounts and potentially investments that works for you. And then I'll add in here, mind your limits. Everything we just spoke about is very general in nature, but before you open an RSP and make contributions, before you open a TFSA and an FHSA, you're gonna want to make sure that you qualify, that you need the qualification criteria for all those accounts. For RSPs and tax-free savings accounts, you're gonna wanna make sure that you're in a position where you have appropriate room where you can make those contributions. Something like the CRA my account is so important so so important for somebody who's over the age of 18 and is earning income I highly recommend that you uh, get access to that portal because it'll give you a lot of information on what your current limits are so that you can sort of keep track and make sure you don't go over uh, or make contributions that you're not supposed to and then the final question we'll talk about today reads I want to live off of my RSP until age 70 and at that time I want to take Canada pension plan and old age security and as I withdraw from my RSP, I want to contribute funds from it to my tax-free savings account. Is this a good idea? And I think this absolutely can be a very good idea. And I do work with a number of retirees who enter retirement with predominantly or all of their retirement money in pre-tax accounts like RRSPs, locked in retirement accounts, defined contribution pension plans, spells or RSPs, RIFs, spells or RIFs, LIFs. All of those are pre-tax accounts, meaning that the money that eventually comes out while they're taking income in retirement is going to be taxable income in their hands. They don't have any tax-free savings accounts. But for someone who's retiring at age 65, who's made no previous tax-free savings account contributions, as of this year, if they meet the other criteria, meaning that they've, you know, they're a Canadian resident and have been in, in you know, all of the last, we'll call it, you know, 15, 18 years or so since the TFSA was introduced. If they're a Canadian resident throughout that time period, they've made no previous contributions or they had previously had a TFSA and they've withdrawn all the money out of it. See all these qualifications you have to make when you create a general video. There's so many little factors you got to watch out for, but let's just assume that this person qualifies for the maximum TFSA room. It's currently $95,000 for a Canadian that kind of ticks all those boxes. In a lot of cases, there are retirees that are entering retirement with $95,000 in tax-free savings account per member of the couple. So, you know, approaching $200,000 of tax-free savings account room. And sometimes people in that situation will look at me and be like, you know, I feel like I missed the boat on tax-free savings accounts. And I say, no, not even close. Like the tax-free savings account can be a fantastic tool for you in retirement and they can be great for retirees. There's a few really great benefits to the TFSA for long-term planning and retirement. First, you know, clearly they're tax efficient. What the money that goes into them is tax-free. While you're retired, you're not necessarily as interested in that tax deduction because in a lot of cases, you might be in sort of that lowest tax situation that you might be throughout the rest of your life on a sustained basis. So the tax-free savings account can be very tax efficient. Money grows tax-free. Eventually withdrawals are tax-free as well. Number two, they're very estate friendly. So if you have a tax-free savings account and you have a spouse, you can name what's called a successor holder. So what that means is that when you pass away, immediately the account sort of moves over to your spouse. They don't require any new tax-free savings account room you know, to facilitate that transaction. It just It's just like you kind of airlifted your tax-free savings account and it's now you know goes from being a you account to a spouse account. And you can also name multiple beneficiaries. So now let's keep that example going. Now there's only one member of the spouse couple. They have really the combined value of the two tax free savings accounts. Now they can name multiple beneficiaries. They can name their kids. This is just the most frequent thing that I see is that they're naming their kids as beneficiaries. That allows the proceeds of the tax free savings account to bypass the estate. Um, it's usually very quick and proceeds from the tax free savings account are tax free. So it's a very estate friendly account. And number three, it can be dipped into for large purposes. 
later in retirement. So let's say you've got some excess money in retirement that you haven't spent and you put in your tax-free savings account. That's a great candidate for you know a car purchase maybe eight or 10 years down the road when you want to refresh your car. So tax-free savings accounts, using surpluses to fund them in retirement provided you have the room, great strategy. I absolutely love it. So the answer to that question is yes. There was something else in this question that sort of jumped out at me that I wanted to address. And the way that the question reads is that the questioner may be looking at a strategy where they want to melt down their RSPs. As I withdraw from my RSP, I want to contribute the funds from it to my tax-free savings account. This is a question that I do get sometimes, or I see a lot of videos on YouTube that talk about RSP meltdowns, like everybody should do one. And I think that sometimes people can get you know, quote unquote, meltdown happy. And their strategy walking in is I want to melt down my RSP in the early years of retirement because I want to get my money out of pre-tax accounts and I want to get it into tax-free savings accounts and I want to get it into non-registered accounts. And it seems like the objective of this is really driven exclusively by tax. The thinking behind this is that it's sort of better to pay the piper now, better to pay the tax now at low rates than it is to pay a big tax bill when you die, or there's fear that tax rates are going to go up in the future or that tax rates must go up in the future. Therefore, I need to get my retirement money out of my RSPs as soon as possible. And this strategy can work, but it certainly will cause you to interrupt the tax sheltered compounding that is going on inside of your pre-tax accounts. If you take money out of the RSP, you pay the tax bill now, that tax deferral party is going away. So you need to sort of balance off your objectives here. Is your objective to pay less tax or is your objective to maximize your lifetime income? And there's really two main unknowns that I wanna to bring to your attention as we think about this. Number one, we don't know when we're gonna pass away. So if I'm sitting with a healthy 65 year old couple and we knew for sure that they were going to pass away in 10 years, you know, that would make our RSP meltdown possibly look better. So we might be more inclined to fill up those low brackets now by making those withdrawals and moving it to non-registered and tax-free. But the reality is we don't know when we're going to die. And for a healthy couple that has longevity in their family, that's active, my base case for that retiree couples that they're gonna to live to at least age 95. So I think as a base case, let's plan for that. And I think that we should employ strategies that build off of that assumption, unless the person that's sitting across from me has a really strong opinion about that. We should plan for long life. And number two, we don't know what tax rates are going to be in the future. So I do take issues sometimes with people say, well, they automatically are going to go up. So we should for sure do a meltdown because taxes are going to be higher in the future. We don't know what taxes are going to be in the future. And so I think that the, the most prudent thing to do is just assume they're kind of going to look like they currently are today. And again, the goal of long-term retirement income planning to me is to maximize lifetime income. It's not to pay the least amount of tax possible. And it's not to leave a tax-free or minimum tax estate unless the person sitting across the table from me has told me that I really hate paying taxes and I'm okay to lower my lifetime income so I can pay the minimum amount of taxes possible. Or they say, I want for sure for when my money goes to the next generation that I pay as small a tax bill on my passing as possible, okay? So it is possible that the plan that maximizes your lifetime income actually sees you paying slightly more income taxes over the life of your plan. I'm going to repeat that. It's possible that the plan that maximizes your after-tax lifetime income actually sees you paying slightly more income taxes. And it's also possible that a plan that aims strictly to minimize taxes will reduce your lifetime spending. So in closing, there are many situations where it does not make sense to melt down an RSP early. In fact, in many cases, retirees are better off to let RSP assets compound and withdraw from a blend of RSPs, non-registered and tax-free savings accounts early in retirement. So I guess the takeaway for this part of the answer is RSP meltdowns can make sense. They don't always make sense. So let's make sure that we build a plan that's based on your own unique situation before we sort of take an all or nothing approach to melting down RSPs in retirement. So hopefully you found this format of video to be helpful. If you like it, give it a thumbs up. Leave me any questions or comments below. If you have a question you want to submit for the mailbag episode, there's a survey below two questions you can fill out and I'll get to your question in a future episode. And if you're looking for a second opinion on your retirement plan, you can certainly reach out to me. I am accepting some clients over the summer and I've included a link where you can book some time on my calendar or you can simply send me an email and I'd be happy to talk about your situation and see if I might be a fit for your needs. Thanks for watching this video all the way to the end and I will speak with you soon. Take care.